Hi guys, and welcome to week eight, where we're gonna cover correlation. So this will be our first week of real statistical testing, because up to this point, we've covered visualization and data screening. And so now we're really getting into running statistics. And you're like, man, we're halfway through the semester. <laughs> but all of these other components are very important because we'll use them now integrated into this chapter. Right, so let's start with what is a correlation? Right. It is a way of measuring the extent to which two variables are related. So everything we've used as examples so far have been as a mean of the model, and that's one variable at a time. Maybe we split that by two groups or something, but now let's work with multiple variables. Okay. And so correlation comp is composed of two important components, the direction and strength of a relationship. So direction means that they could be unrelated, no direction. <laughs> they can be positively related as one goes up, the other one goes up, or they could be negatively related as one goes up, the other one goes down. For strength, there could be no strength and then they're not related or all the way up to perfect. So perfectly positively related, such as one, or perfectly negatively related, which is a negative one. In reality, we don't necessarily expect perfect correlations, but we could expect a whole range of them from negative one to one. So here's a visualization of no relationship where the dots don't make any discernible linear pattern. So we're gonna mostly focus on linear statistics in this course um, with some brief examples of some non-parametric statistics. And so that's why in our data screening section, linearity was a big component. Right? And so here our line is almost straight across. And when you see that, or just a blob of dots, you can't really tell. To me, this looks like a frog. Um, that implies there's probably no relationship between X and Y. Let's contrast that with a positive relationship where we can start to see the dots line up in a neat line. The closer they get to being in a straight line, the closer it is the correlation is to one. But we know that there's going to be some variance because people vary. And so we have to figure out how far away from one it is. And that'll give us a measure of our, our strength of relationship. Um, and then the direction of the relationship is usually pretty visual. So as one goes up, the other goes up here. And so the uh, linear line, if we drew it on here, would lean to the right. Conversely, a negative relationship is just the other way. The line leans to the left, whereas one variable goes up, the other one goes down. Okay. So the longer I record these videos, the less voice I have, that kind of thing. Okay, which is why I have my hot water. So correlations are often visualized with scatter plots. So one thing I hope you'll notice as we go is that in every chapter, we're going to incorporate things that we have already gone over. Right. So we're going to bring back data visualization. We're going to talk about model fit. We're going to talk about hypothesis testing and data screening. So every chapter we've done so far has led us to now applying each of those to our statistical tests. So scatter plots, as a reminder, since it's been a couple weeks since graphs, okay, what we do is we first build a blank ggplot that includes the data, the x-axis, the y-axis variables, these are continuous, and then potentially a categorical color if we want to split by groups. Then we start adding things like our cleanup code, our points, a geom point, which has the dots, our geom smooth if we want to add the line just to help us see which way the direction goes because sometimes these graphs are hard to read. Okay. And then our X and Y axis labels. Something new here we're going to talk about is chord Cartesian. This is allowing us to control the length of X and Y. Since these are continuous variables, basically what we can do is um, chop off part of the graph or add more graph. So for example, Let's say we want to control the uh, graph of the data by making the X axis run from zero to 100 and the Y axis run from zero to 101. Now, sometimes you'll need to run it slightly outside the range of the data 
because the dots will kind of hang off the edge otherwise. This also allows us on a graph that um, the data is Likert scaled, so one to seven, to cut off that zero that it automatically adds at the bottom. And so this really gives us a little bit more control over what our gra graph has in it. So let's look at an example of that. So all this stuff we've covered before. So we've imported our two libraries, Rio, so that we can open the data, and ggplot so we can make some pictures. And then here's all that um, cleanup code that we've been using just to make the text bigger and the backgrounds cleaner. Now these are this is directly from the chapter five notes. So we're plotting the relationship of anxiety about an exam and the exam scores. And what we see, if we look at this, is there appears to be this negative relationship between them. So as anxiety goes up, scores go down. But potentially, we could say, well, these guys out here are outliers because how do you not have any anxiety in a statistics exam? So maybe we want to only look at the people who aren't outliers. So let's chop them off, see what happens. And this is where chord Cartesian can be handy to um, just graphically eliminate that portion of the data. So we could say the X limit is 50 to 100 and the Y limit is zero to 100. It still appears somewhat negative, right? We've got this kind of shape, but we might have to run the statistic to see. And so this is just a reminder down here that these are just example numbers. You would wanna do this in the real scale of the data. So if your anxiety score only runs from 50 to 100, you shouldn't show us zero to 50 on the graph. In this case, it does run from zero to 100. I just chopped off half the graph. So let's get into now how correlation fits into the broader scheme of our class. So we have this sort of all-in-one statistical equation. There's two of those. The first one is the model that we're going to use. Okay. And every person's outcome or every data point, if you will, if they're not people, I'm just used to using people, every outcome variable is measured by having some sort of model plus error. And before what we were doing was saying the model is the mean and our standard deviation um, or standard error is kind of a representation of global error. Because we can think about every person's score is the mean of the entire group plus or minus some amount. And then we're basically averaging that plus or minus some amount to get our standard deviation. And so we we're using standard error or standard deviation, either one, to determine if our model fit well. So we've been using the mean as our model and then seeing how big that standard error was to see about the fit. Because remember, the idea behind fit isn't um, statistical significance. The, uh, I really want to separate this idea of hypothesis testing with knowing that the data represents something useful. Okay? And so models that have good fit, what that implies is that you've measured them well. Okay? We want to know the the actual parameter and the population, which we're going to represent with this sample. And we'll calculate the sample mean, for example. But if the confidence interval or our standard errors, because those are related, okay, remember that confidence intervals are approximately two times standard error. Okay. So if the confidence interval is really wide, what we're saying is, well, the true population parameter is actually between all of these values. And that doesn't give me a lot of confidence in the mean is my model when it varies this much. Well, yeah, sure, here's this one value, but it actually varies by all these numbers. So who knows what it really is? We measure, when we say models have good fit, what we're implying is that that point estimate, that mean, is a good representation of the data because the, everything else around it is just a little bit of variability. You don't want no variance, that's no good either. And people vary, so you expect some variance, but you don't want so much variance that you are don't have a good feel for what the data is. Okay, so model fit here is just thinking about is this per, is this parameter that I'm trying to estimate measured well? Okay. 
And this really lines up with a lot of the of our more complex statistics that focus less on p-values and more on fitting the data. So how do I switch that up when I have more than one variable? Now I have two. Okay, and my interest is in the relationship to each other, not just themselves. So we can switch this equation up and come up with a new model. And I'm going to propose this model because we're going to use it again next week. So this is the basic model for a standardized regression. And everything we're going to do this semester is some form of linear regression. Correlation is probably the simplest linear regression we could do with 1x and 1y. Multiple regression, which we'll do next week, is more complex, multiple x's, 1y. And then we'll cover even more like complex regression with uh, interactions and mediation. And then at the end of the semester, we'll cover um, special cases for regression. So t-tests and ANOVA, while they're gonna seem very different, are actually just a slightly different form of regression math. So everything we're doing, this class should be called uh, general linear models <laughs> because what we're actually focusing on is using the, the linear model in different forms to create our model fit. So here's a simple form of a linear model where every person's outcome is predicted by some, so that's y, okay? It's predicted by some x score that they have times a standardized value. Okay. Here I've got this listed as beta, and then there's always a little bit of error. Okay, we always have error. Never predicted everybody perfectly. Okay. And beta here is, represents that this is a standardized regression. So next week we'll talk about what happens when you don't standardize it. And correlation is um, the equivalent to a standardized regression when you have one X and one Y. Okay, so R for our correlation coefficient and beta are equal. And I'll prove that to you next week. Okay, for, for right now, take my word for it. Okay. So now we can use R or beta to talk about model fit. So we can use R as our model, so our correlation coefficient, and then we'll look at confidence intervals to determine how well those, how well that correlation fits. This is an entirely different question than asking about the mean. We, when we represent the mean as a model, we're often using it to compare two groups to each other, okay, or more, two or more, or just say here's the the data. Correlation as a model represents the relationships in the data. And so when we do regression next week, we'll talk about how do I represent many relationships at once. So we're going to start simple with one X and one Y. Okay. And then at the end of this lecture, we realize that correlation is not as simple as you thought it was. <laughs> so, well, that's my goal anyway. Um, so I'm convincing you that this is the same equation as our, our mean as a model. We're just switching now to correlation being the model. And traditionally, you don't see a lot of error values reported with correlation. I find this unfortunate, and I'll tell you why I think it happens in a little bit. Um, sometimes you'll see confidence intervals, but not always. And so I'm going to try to change that by teaching you how to do it right. All right. So if we're going to use correlation as a model of the relationship between variables, how do we actually do that? Well, we need to see if as one variable increases, does the other one increase? It's a positive relationship. Decrease, negative relationship. Or doesn't, doesn't change, no relationship. And then to do that, we could actually just calculate covariance. Okay, we haven't covered a whole lot of covariance. We mostly just covered variance before. So what the heck is covariance? What you do for covariance is the same thing that you do for variance. So you take each score, so I have X and I have Y, how far away are each of those X's and Y's from their own respective means? So for each variable, how far away are they? Okay. And what we can do is take those deviations and use the sign. So normally we spend a lot of time squaring things because remember these all add up to zero. But in this case, we won't, because what we're going to say is, well, actually, let's just look at how far X is away from its mean, and how far Y is away from its mean. If they're both positive all the time together, 
That means they're going up together. If they're both negative all the time together, that means they're going down together, which is the same thing, right? It creates this pattern. So they're either both negative or both positive. If they're always opposites, X is negative, Y is positive, X is positive, Y is negative, that means it's a negative relationship. Okay, so we can start to create this like pattern by understanding how much they change away from their means at the same time. So if they're going up together, they'll both be above the mean together and they'll both be below the mean together. If they're a negative relationship, one up, one down, one will be above the mean, one will be below the mean, always. If there's no relationship, it's just a mess. It's all over the place. That's a really nice statistic. So let's look at how that's calculated. So remember that the variance tells us how much each score deviates from its mean for a single variable. So we can write variance in this first equation where it's the sum of squares. So the sum of each uh, X person score minus the mean squared divided by our degrees of freedom, which is in minus one. Now I could also expand that equation. No fancy math necessary in this class, but just gonna expand that equation um, to show that this is X times, X minus one, <laughs> X minus the mean times X minus the mean. How would I get Y in here? So now I have X and Y. Well, that's actually quite simple. Just change one of them out for Y. So now we have that same variance formula, but one of them is X and one of them is Y. And they're multiplied by each other. So this doesn't sum to zero anymore because we're multiplying the weight of X and the weight of Y. Now, the weight of all the X's adds up to zero and the weight of all the Y's adds up to zero, but we are multiplying them first. Okay. So we don't, we don't, um, they don't sum to zero together. Otherwise we'd have to square it, <laughs> but we don't have to in this instance because we're creating what are called cross products. So it's the cross products of the differences between them. Okay. It doesn't mean to multiply, it's a fancy word. Okay. So covariance tells us how much these two scores differ from their own respective means okay. and then multiply those by each other. So think about it, if they're both positive, the sum of those will be positive. Okay. If they're both negative, the sum of those will still be positive because a negative times a negative is positive. Okay. If one's positive and one's negative, the sum of those will be negative. So that allows us, by not squaring them, that allows us to hold on to the direction part. Okay. So we squared it in variance because adding up to zero is mathematically not useful at that moment. Okay. We don't square them in covariance because we want to hang on to the direction part. So the one problem with covariance is it suffers from the same issues that variance does. Okay. So here I've just got an example where I've calculated the variance of our um, revising of exams okay, and the variance of our exam scores. And I don't know how to interpret these. Okay. I know the exam scores range from zero to 100, but if you told me the variance is 627, I'd be like, and, right? If we took the square root of that, um, which I can do really quickly, uh, square root, oh wait, I have R over here. What do we say? SQRT 627, there we go, 25 points. Okay. By taking the square root of that, what I know now is that the exam on average had a lot of variance, right? It varied by two and a half letter grades above and below the mean. Whew, it's a lot of range, okay. <coughs> excuse me. But in general, the interpretation of variance here is very difficult. And let's look at what covariance is, maybe it'll make sense. So the function for covariance is COV, you know, X and Y. Okay. Well, any two variables, it doesn't matter what order they are because it, it's the same either direction. So it's 186 points. I don't know what that means. Do you know what that means? Meh. Meh. So that's in the scale of the data, but it's two scales multiplied by each other. 
So I'm not sure how to interpret that number. Now, if I made myself a nice little plot here, this is a revisions by exams and that's a pot. Oh, okay, I can tell it's positive relationship. Well, this number is positive, so I could have figured that out on my own. I still don't have a good feel for the strength because if the scale was in income, which is a large number, covariance also gets very large. So it suffers from the same problem as variance. Therefore, the solution is what you can probably guess since that's what this lecture is about, correlation. Okay. It does vary by the units of measurement, which is often a good thing, but in this scenario is not because we're multiplying them. And so I, I jokingly told someone earlier that statistics is a uh, game of standardization. If you don't have a good answer, the answer is to standardize it. Okay. Square it, that's math's answer to everything. If it adds up to zero and you don't want it to, square it. <laughs> but statistics answers to everything is to standardize it. Okay. So we can divide by the standard deviation of both variables to convert covariance into something useful. Okay. And the standardized version of covariance is the correlation coefficient. So that's why we're going to use this as our model. So I said it's a standardized regression. All of these things are equally tied, right? Covariance is the unstandardized form, basically. And um, correlation is the standardized form. Okay, this is where beta comes in. And it says here it's relatively unaffected by the units of measurement. I think it just should say it is unaffected by the units of measurement. It does not matter when you're calculating correlation, if it's in income or millimeters or milliseconds or number of coffee cups, if it's continuous, and we'll, we'll get, come back to this idea of if it's continuous in a little bit, um, all of these can now be compared against each other because they're standardized. And so that's really what statistics likes to do is the standardization allows for comparison and these sort of um, statistical questions that we'll ask. Okay. So if you Google like the formula for correlation coefficient, you'll actually see a bunch of different ones. Um, here, what we see is that we, we could say it's covariance divided by this cross products of the standard deviations. It's actually could be calculated with the cross products of the Z scores. Um, or, you know, simply this is the covariance formula divided by the multiplication of standard deviation. There's a lot of different mathematically equivalent forms for this. Okay. But we're gonna make R do this because that's the entire point of working with uh, technology is that we don't have to do this nasty math by hand. So we can look at R here to determine our strength and direction of relationship, positive, negative, how strong is it? That doesn't tell me how good the model is. Okay, so the strength of the relationship meaning is it a no relationship, zero, or is it really strong relationship, um, 0.5, okay. But that doesn't tell me if the, um, the correlation coefficient is a good model for that data, okay. So what we're gonna do is add the confidence interval for R, which effectively tells us the um, approximation of standard error because with a large enough sample size, it's a, it, approximately two times standard error. Okay. This has been, you don't see this as much as I would like in like traditional reporting. People just tell you what the correlation is and I'm like, but how much does it vary? And they're like, what? Because it used to be a big pain, very annoying <laughs> to calculate the co uh, co mm, confidence intervals. There, there's the word. Um, because it requires a, a kind of a couple of different mathematical transforms forwards and backwards, but R does this very easily. And one thing I'll mention uh, in several of these lectures is that the way that people do things is sometimes heavily tied to the available options in a piece of statistical software. And so SPSS for a long time was a, one of the main drivers of these different facets and they just didn't have, I don't even know if they do, have um, the ability to calculate confidence intervals easily. So we just didn't report them because they weren't easy to calculate. And there are other kind of uh, other well-known moments 
where um, for a long time people report, misreported uh, some popular effect sizes because it was mislabeled in SPSS. So it happens. But I'm going to solve that problem now by teaching you a program that will allow you to do this and it makes it very easy. Win for everyone. And so we can use that confidence interval to assess model fit. Okay. Just like I used the standard error or the confidence interval for the mean to detest, to detest, to detect the model fit. Okay. This is just water, I promise. <laughs> All right. So a little bit more about the correlation coefficient. It varies between one and one, we've covered this, but this looks like a good test question. Okay. Where zero is no relationship and anything close to one is very strong. And technically correlations are an effect size. So that means they have some rules, 0.1 for small, 0.3 for medium, 0.5 for large, with the big old caveat that those are just guidelines. In the research I do with my clinic, clinical psych friends, these are pretty close to a lot of their work, where if we got a correlation of 0.2, we'd be pretty excited because it was small, but maybe important. In my own research field, well, I'm trying to predict maybe response latencies, if I'm not hitting 0.6 or 0.7 in my correlation, I'm not doing very well. Okay. So these are heavily dependent on the field that you are working in. And the interesting thing is that correlation is actually two effect sizes. Okay. So you thought correlation was simple, right? It can be used as a raw effect size, or we can convert correlations into what's called the coefficient of determination. Okay, nobody calls it this, everybody calls it R squared. Okay. Why would you do that? Well, the nice thing about R squared is that um, it's always positive. Uh, there's one of our solutions. Um, but it tells me the proportion of variance that overlaps between the two variables. Okay. So the, the statistician in me loves to standardize things. Okay, R is already standardized, but this is a nice number to tell people. Okay. I can account for 25% of the reason of the variability in people's answers with this variable. Okay. And that's a large effect size. So if you kind of want to know some, some values that you can use for the uh, small, medium, and large, you could literally just square these. Okay. There are some other suggestions for these kinds of sizes, but I think it's just as easy to say, just square it. And so this is a, a handy number to use. And we'll see why partially on the next slide and partially next week. So I also want to talk about a difference that is subtle it's a little pedantic, but is, I think, important. So when people use big R and they don't mean the software, and then they use little r. Okay, what is the difference if I see that reported that I, I hope people are using? Okay. So big R, not the software, is the correlation coefficient for three or more variables. Okay. This is in the regression chapter, where we'll see what's the relationship between our predicted score and the actual score. And our predicted score has six variables in it. Okay. Little r is the correlation coefficient for two variables. Okay. r squared is our coefficient of determination for two variables. And so big r squared is the, the, the really useful one that you'll see a lot of, where it's our coefficient of determination for three or more variables. Okay. And so what that tells me is all of these variables together allow me to predict 35% of the variance. And that's a really useful number. Whereas before saying the correlation for each one ignores the fact that they probably overlap. So by having one number that I can say, here's how much variance is accounted for um, as my effect size, um, that's really handy. So the usefulness of R by itself versus R squared is really a, um, a personal choice because they, practically both tell you an effect size, but some people like to interpret variance accounted for a percent and some, or proportion, and some people like to interpret the raw number. So in practicality, you'll see off, you'll often see people use R squared anytime they're talking about effect sizes, even if it's only two. And then in, in my 
journal reviews, I write, not to be pedantic, but that is wrong. <laughs> so um, know what they mean by, by squaring it. It's just they've decided to interpret this as proportions rather than the correlation. Okay. So how do we calculate correlations? Well, we've been doing this. That's what's awesome, right? It's just core. Okay. And so our correlation between this exam residuals and the exam anxiety scores is positive. Okay, so it's 0.4 effectively and medium. Cool. At the moment, I know literally nothing about the other two parts of this though. Okay. So I, I can tell you, this is my model. I don't have any good clue about my model fit because I haven't calculated any kind of confidence interval. And I really have no idea of my statistical test, what would happen with my statistical test. Okay. So there's kind of three components to, to these different chapters, right? So we have whatever we're building as the model, okay? And it's fit to the data, okay? We want the model fit to be good because that means the samples represented, well, <sighs> representative is a different word, right? We could get a completely, we could say that all college freshmen match the entire world, which is silly, but um, the, the sample is at least um, we've tried. <laughs> it's large enough that maybe it'll capture the true parameter. So we've got model fit, uh, model, the model and the fit, right? Then we have to think about the um, statistical test and the null hypothesis testing stuff and the effect size. Well, the nice thing about correlation is that it's two for one. It's the model and the effect size. In other tests later in this uh, semester, we'll see that we need to calculate a separate effect size. So there's where we're gonna stop briefly and take a quick break and move on to those other questions about correlation being, um, what's the, about the statistical test and the uh, other things we can do with correlation in the next video.